Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Hello, listener. If you cast your mind back to February 2018, I discussed the German fighter pilot's experience in the West with Patrick Ericsson. That's episode 60, if anyone wants another listen. Later that year, Patrick followed up with a second book, Alarm Start East, focusing on the Luftwaffe fighting over Russia. That's episode 85. Well, Patrick has now finished his trilogy of Luftwaffe books with Alarm Start South and the final defeat, closing with the German experience flying in and around the Mediterranean, so North Africa, Sicily, Malta, etc., through to the end of the war. So I've asked him back for a chat. As we've already been chatting for a while, patrons, look out for Patrick telling me about his research into the Battle of Britain. Not already a patron? Well, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast to find out about signing on. Where possible, I do try to make available extra bits and pieces to those ardent World War II buffs who support the show. A dollar or two each month from listeners like yourself helps me find the time to put the show together. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Patrick, welcome back. We've uh, looked at the air war in the West with the fall of France and the Battle of Britain. Uh, last time we discussed the Luftwaffe on the Eastern Front, which leaves the war in and around the Med. Uh, I would have guessed the first action in that theatre would be Greece, but uh, it's not, is it? It's, it's Yugoslavia. Yeah. Yugoslavia is a few days before Greece, even though the invasion date was the same for both countries. But the most of the German Air Force concentrated on Yugoslavia for the first three, four days and then shifted to Greece when they flattened the poor Yugoslavia. And so, uh, yeah, it, this this is the, the whole Mediterranean thing. A lot of things happened in parallel. The entire North African war was parallel to, to another war going on from Malta, overlapping in time completely. And some of those overlapped with the Balkans, some of those overlapped with what went on in Iraq and Syria and so on. Yugoslavia, I'm right in saying that the, it's the only occasion where the Luftwaffe flew against other ME 109s. Yeah, it's not the only. Yeah, there's one other would be uh, after the Russians invaded Romania and made the armistice, and some of the Romanians flew their 109s against the German 109s. But uh, is it of any interest the one or did the, the were the Luftwaffe just better trained and just flattened them? Well, the Luftwaffe actually trained a lot of the Yugoslavian pilots. Uh, I remember one of the guys I, I quoted there actually felt quite bad about that aspect because he trained some of these guys that he was in, obviously flying against. And uh, but but Yugoslavia had a big problem in terms of loyalty. There were six or seven totally disparate. People shoved together in this post World War One country called Yugoslavia. The, the Croatians, the Croats, were basically traitors even before the German invasion of Yugoslavia. One of them, a captain, which is quite a high rank to desert, flew his aeroplane to a German base and landed and told them where all the good targets were a few days before the invasion. And that's an unusual aspect to have in any any war situation. So you've got pilots who are trained by you know the same country. So in theory, they've got the same sort of uh, doctrine, uh, tactics. So how did the ME-109 fare against another ME-109? Training someone to fly, even for an Air Force, the tactical thing is done right at the end and depending on the country very badly or very well. And the Germans wouldn't have passed that on because they learned that themselves in, in Spain and Poland and so on. And they, that they would have kept to themselves. So the, the, the Yugoslavian pilots in the 109s didn't feature very well. They were basically, you know, shot out of the sky in two, three days. So they were trained well to fly, etc., etc., but they had no tactical doctrine and no tactical training. The other trouble was they had aircraft from France, Italy, Germany, Britain, and their own aircraft. So just think of the maintenance, the, the spare parts, you know, the, the different fuels, oils, etc., etc. You can't fight a war like that, basically. So, so from there, they're into Greece. Now, this is... Uh, presumably these will be um, facing British pilots and presumably potentially both sets of pilots, uh, veteran pilots, or did the British retain their best pilots for Britain at this point? The, the, the British pilots that went to Greece came from North Africa, so they had some experience in North Africa, but not, not against the Germans. They had experience flying against the Italians and 
in, in North Africa, but this was uh, April 1941. So the Germans only went into North Africa, the German Air Force, in about uh, J January, February 1941, and only really started operating in April. So these were pre-war RAF pilots, well-trained, uh, experienced, and, and with some combat exposure against the Italians. Under the circumstances, they did very well in Greece, really very well. They were massively outnumbered by the Germans, though, weren't they? Massively outnumbered. Uh, the 109 was a much more dangerous aircraft than the Hurricanes they were flying. Their, their bases were primitive. The supply of fuel, spare parts and things like that, you know, very, uh, very broken up. It was an impossible situation, basically. That's why Patel got killed there. And under normal circumstances, he would probably have lasted a lot longer. And he's that That's the British fighter ace. Yeah, he's South African, actually. So, yeah, yeah. Both those squadrons in Greece, 33 and 80 squadrons, were superb squadrons. And not just Petal, but almost all those pilots did very well. And uh, oh, right, so he was the, the highest scoring uh, RAF fighter ace of the war. Supposedly, but the, the, Greek, the records of these squadrons didn't survive the Greek campaign. So... Uh, one can't be sure. I, I think the the estimate would be from 40, 42 up to 50 victories or even more, depending which source you're consulting. But uh, there's no proof of it. If you look at known claims for Petal and, and German losses, then uh, he comes out pretty well out of that sort of comparison, as much as one can do that comparison. But the books of Christopher Shaw's and his co-authors make it possible to do a pretty reasonable comparison in certain actions. They were really an outstanding RAF lot. I'm thinking, I've just read some of it again today. I can think of two cases where they claimed five and got four, and the other one they claimed four and got three. Now, that's very high success rates for claims. Presumably, it was the highest scoring, but how do you put full confidence on anyone's score at any time of the war, records or no records? It's not really possible to do. Something that occurred to me as well about the, the Luftwaffe and sort of Greece is, is Crete. Um, you know, it's, it's, hu it's this huge airborne campaign with uh, uh, troops parachuting and being flown in. But it, it was only when I was thinking about that that it occurred to me that we never actually hear what the uh, Luftwaffe fighters are doing at, at this point because the, 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 the focus is always on really the ground battle from the airborne campaign, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Well, the, the RAF pulled out of Greece a, a couple of days before the end of the Greek campaign and then there were several weeks before they went into Crete and the remnants of some of the units from Greece were stationed on Crete for a while but once the Germans started their attacking airfields and pre-invasion bombing and so on they, they were rapidly pulled out because they, they had no real maintenance facilities, spare parts nothing like that on the Cretan airfields and then once the, the invasion had begun, they were trying to provide protection from Egypt, which they did. There's a table in the book there somewhere of, of a quite remarkable number of attempts to provide support from Egypt, and even bringing in hurricanes and leaving them overnight. But the thing is, they got damaged and bombed on the ground so fast it was pointless. So the German fighter pilots in Crete spent a lot of their time doing ground strafing in support of their paratroopers and army and also attacking ships with small bombs taking the Royal Navy north and south of the island. So in North Africa, the Luftwaffe, I think the Luftwaffe are there, which you said before, the Africa Corps. Uh, yes, um, slightly, a few months before, the, uh, speaking from memory now, the first Luftwaffe units came in in January 1941, and by April 41 they had a, a sort of coordinated air arm operating bombers, fighters, etc. And the Africa Corps, I think, started advancing in about April Forty-one. So the Air Force was a couple of months, or elements of the Air Force were a couple of months before the Africa Corps. Yeah. You know, when the Africa Corps starts arriving, how do they task what their operations are? Or, or does the Luftwaffe become, you know, that flying artillery for the Africa Corps? Or are they very much an independent arm that they're doing all kinds of things and the Army makes requests of them? Well, the Luftwaffe was an independent arm as much as Goering let them do whatever they did or not. But in, in the bigger picture, the Luftwaffe was almost always flying support to the German army. That was almost always their role. The only, the only major theater where that was not the case was the Battle of Germany, of course, the Battle of Britain as well. But otherwise, if there was major ground fighting, the Luftwaffe's main job was to provide support for the ground fighting. 
and in North Africa, very much the case too. Does that mean, I, 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 I'm thinking of two, two previous conversations, that they're flying sort of escort missions for Stukas, uh, those kind of things, or are they trying to uh, just attack the RAF wherever they can to you know, rack up scores to bring down uh, uh, the RAF su- uh, supremacy? Oh, actually, they didn't have, they have supremacy, did the they? The answer to that is both. Uh, <laughs> they would escort the Stukas and the bombers, and because it was, because the, the, the action in the air was only a 10 or 15 miles either side of the front lines, and the front lines were fluid often, uh, the operations of the Stukas and the bombers are very short, so often the escorting fighters afterwards could do an air superiority or free chase role anyway. They almost always had free chasers in addition to escorted bombers in the same area. They had the whole lot going on, even if it's in small numbers. You know, this is the German forces in the Second World War, Navy excluded, but we're, we're always focused on success on the battlefield. Now, that's kill more of the enemy than you lose yourself. This is That was their basic philosophy, in there, on the ground, with tanks, with inf- infantry, with everybody. Unfortunately for them, it might have been a a battle winning and tactical advantage, but it was a war losing strategy. I think I'm right in saying you got Collishaw directing the RAF to move beyond and try and operate behind the German lines, knocking out uh, logistics, which is not what the Luftwaffe were doing. And uh, the RAF was always focused, number one priority was to get at the bombers at whatever cost. And if it was at the cost of fighters to protect their bombers, that was all right for them because. A lost bomber, three or four crew in a much more expensive aircraft. A lost fighter, one person in a cheap aircraft. So they never had, they never changed that at all, and they always paid the price. The German fighter arm, with the the way they thought and the way they fought and their traditions, would not have done that. Well, they didn't do it, and they weren't really prepared to do it. How much of a unique environment was the desert for the Luftwaffe compared with the steppes of uh, Russia or so the fields of Northwest Europe? Did, did it give them different challenges? Oh, yes. The North Africa gave everyone the same challenge, but it was a horrible place. The climate was terrible. The What one doesn't realize is in many cases and at most of the time, soldiers on the ground or airmen would have to survive on a, a half a gallon or a gallon of water a day for all purposes for cooking, for, for drinking, for washing, for shaving, everything. So water was extremely limited. It was poor quality water. It was hard tack and bully beef. Uh, their food was terrible. The climate was terrible. The nights were just as cold as the days were hot. You know, hygiene-wise, it was dreadful in most places. Flies, plagues of flies over everything. If you read some of the accounts, the, the people, while they're eating, their mouth, their face, their food, their hand, everything's covered in flies. If it wasn't hot and dry, it would have been a major health problem. Uh, the desert was a dreadful place, full of sandstorms, and the bases were not airfields in any established sense, except for way back, you know, around Alexandra or Cairo. But otherwise, these were frontline airfields, just uh, with all the rocks moved out the road and so on, but no buildings, no facilities whatsoever. Everything's in tents. So a very rough environment for everybody. Or if at a slight advantage, you know, from the, how can I put it, the colonial background of many of them, they were used to primitive airfields and conditions, whereas the Germans were a continental power operating from Germany outwards. In a civilised Europe, they were less adapted to this sort of thing. Well, I, I did get the feeling that the, uh, yeah, as you said, the RAF in the uh, uh, North Africa, to Africa are very much a very polyglot kind of uh, unit with South Africa's New Zealanders, Australia's it seems like a, it, it seems less of a it says more of a mixed bag than, it in, than it, the RAF in Britain, if that makes sense. Certainly large proportions of South Africans, Australians, New Zealand are more on the ground than in the air, free French, uh, Greek units, and later on American units are very much a Commonwealth mixture of people. And I think that gave them a certain advantage too and a certain strength, the sheer diversity of people, backgrounds and capabilities. The colonials would generally be less worried about rough living conditions than the, the British because they'd be more used to that sort of thing. Certainly it gave them, a, I, think, I think, a much stronger air force. And the army was just as diverse as well on the ground. The Eighth Army also had strong elements, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and smaller uh, units from other places. 
three French Greeks and so on. There's one standout German fighter pilot in this theatre, isn't it? That's Han, is it Hans Joachim? What's that? Tell me about him. How many, 158 victories, that's a lot. <laughs> Gelland, who was the, and probably today is also seen still as the most famous German fighter pilot and leader, certainly the most respected amongst them all, and, and he was the general of fighters. He called him the, the uh, absolute virtuoso of fighter pilots, and I think he's right. Uh, there was only one Marseille. His surname is pronounced the same as the French, but he was a French Huguenot stock, just like Gelland. The surname Gelland is also a French Huguenot, and, uh, going back hundreds of years, obviously. You know, Marseille, he's a very interesting character. An enormous number of books have been written about him. And like all really famous people that stand right out from the crowd, there's a lot of... The myth ends up being more important than the, than the truth. There's certainly a lot of myths grown up around him. I was very fortunate in that I lived in the same city as Professor Scovron, who was the one of the uh, leading Luftwaffe psychologists during the war, and he knew Marseille very well. He was actually someone, uh, Scovron, the psychologist, was a, a professor in psycholo psychology in, in Pretoria in South Africa before the war. He was of German extraction, and he went on a research visit shortly before war broke out from South Africa to Germany. And in South Africa, he had been responsible for advising the local Air Force on on what to look for in, in appointing new pilots. And he went to do research in this in Germany, and he was caught there, the outbreak of war, unexpectedly. And because he was German-born, he was shunted off into the armed forces as a as a psychologist. And because they didn't really know what to do with him, he, he got this. He sort of made the assignment for himself to visit frontline units, to observe the pilots, and to see what were the psychological characteristics of those who were very successful leaders and, and fighter aces and so on. So he spent uh, a lot of time uh, from the Battle of Britain in Russia, and especially in North Africa, in Tunisia and, and in the Western Desert, he spent a lot of time with certain units. And Marseille was one of the people that he was close to for months. So he had months to see how Marseille really worked. So a lot of what I concluded about Marseille was based on what he said and told me, and uh, he also had archives of his own, which he freely gave me, many hundreds of pages of his own writings. Yeah, the Marseille legend is that he was uh, a rebel and an anti-Nazi and a playboy and a womanizer and a drinker, That's and a sort of carefree, very able fighter, it's just as an aside almost. Now obviously, that's a, no person is like that. There's all sorts of stories of, of during training that he would stagger back in the morning through the camp gates, late for parades and get away with it and so on. Now, this is obviously nonsense. No, no one doing basic training would ever survive without being thrown into jail or kicked out the forces with that sort of behaviour. And as is shown in the book, some of his, uh, some of the disciplinary records of his have survived. They say exactly the opposite. His disciplinary record is, is a very positive one. And the reports on him by his superiors are basically saying the opposite. They're saying he's a responsible, serious guy. He's young, you know, all young men in that sort of situation get up to the odd thing, but that nothing out of the ordinary. And he got promoted regularly. His reports were good. He was very good in combat situations. He was very good with the people under him. The, the facts such as are available do not support the myths at all. And he's supposed to have been an anti-Nazi, you know, and this is based on him uh, at one party after he'd been given one of his major medals that he played jazz on the piano while Hitler was there and Hitler hated jazz. Well, that doesn't make him an anti-Nazi. His father, his real-life father, was a, a senior police officer and later in the Second World War was a major general and commanding a division of troops behind the front fighting the partisans. Now, when you're on the Eastern Front and the people are fighting the partisans, now we are talking died in the wool Nazis. These are... Now, these are the bad guys. These are getting as close to the Holocaust people as you can get because their definition of partisans is pretty broad. Anyone you didn't like, anyone who was a Russian, anyone who was anything that you didn't approve of would be classified as a partisan and just taken out right there. So his father was most definitely a, a Nazi sympathizer. And his stepfather, with whom he grew up, uh, was an early member of the Nazi party in the 1920s. He was a, a, a member of the of the German Nazi, you know, parliament, etc., etc., and after that he also went into the police arm. So he grew up in a 
in the Nazi environment. And I'm sure he rebelled against it because he was young, you know. And, uh, but his mother, with whom he was very close, married two people who were themselves died in the world Nazis. So the family could not have been anti-Nazi in any real sense. So I don't buy the anti-Nazi thing at all. But most Luftwaffe pilots weren't anti-Nazi, but they weren't pro-Nazi either. They were just trying to survive and do their job and couldn't give a hoot for any politics. So, yeah, what what makes someone like that tick? So I've got all but seven of his 158 victories were against the British over North Africa. Uh, now, usually, usually these big scores are done on the Eastern Front, aren't they? These big scores. So, what makes him so brilliant? Well, this is like this is why Gallen called him the absolute virtuoso. His other seven victories were on the, in the Battle of Britain, which is even harder. Well, so I was posted to his unit on the channel in the Battle of Britain in August, two days after arriving in flying combat. Now, that's very unusual. Even at the worst times of the Battle of Britain, they'd give the guys a week or ten days to settle in. So he must have been very keen and must have given the impression that he could handle it, and he could. Uh, he made seven claims over the channel. He was shot down himself about four or five times doing that. Of his seven claims, I think three only were formally recognized, but the same would apply to many other people too. So he was very successful in and very brave, but also, you might say, very stupid. He was just flying straight into trouble and trying to fight his way out of it, and uh, he didn't do very well there. And, and this is where part of the legend and part of the, the, the reputation as a troublemaker might come from because he was uh, first in a, in, a, in a one unit and then he was transferred to the second group of JG-52 under Steinhoff. And Steinhoff was a very famous German fighter pilot. He was the, the top NATO general after the war. He was a very influential person. And decades after the war, he wrote an article on, on Marseille and said all sorts of things about, you know, being a womanizer and a drinker, and I don't know what all. Again, the reports from that unit, not from Steinhoff himself, but from his subordinates that actually knew Marseille, are very positive. So the the myths about him come from all sorts of quarters and, and are not really supported. But what drove Marseille, as Gavron, the psychologist, classified him as part of his, his uh, group of fighter pilots that he called the... Uh, the very ambitious, sensitive pilots. You know, that's the sort of person that can either, you know, get shot down on mission one or that can really make it big. And he really made it big. When he got to North Africa, he was doing exactly the same as he did over the channel. For every aircraft he claimed, he'd be shot down almost one for one. And then his, his squadron commander there, Neyman, who later became the Geshwara commander as well, he must have seen something in Marseille that his previous units hadn't seen. Because first he sent him over on a long leave a few months after he got there. And uh, when he came back, he told him to stop being so bullet at the gate, stop flying straight into trouble and start seeing how you, you yourself are going to fly, how you see your tactics, how you're going to take out the enemy. And he gave Marseille time off to work out a personal tactical philosophy, if you will. Marsai did practice for weeks, and uh, he practiced largely also chasing the shadow of his own aircraft on the sand and of his colleagues. He basically taught himself how to maneuver an ME-109 at low speeds with the flaps down. The ME-109 was very fast, but it was not maneuverable, and at low speed it was not very stable, so he must have been a hell of a pilot to be able to do this at all. And he was an excellent shot, which is, he was born with that. And uh, gradually he implemented this method and perfected it. And the big thing was he was allowed the time to do that, to teach himself the method and then to apply it. He was supported through and through by his commanding officer. And he got these regular leaves that no one else got of months, two, three, four months, leave back home often. So he would he would fight for two, three months, and he'd go home for two, three months. As time went on and he became more and more successful, the leaves got longer and longer, and the, the successful periods got shorter and more intense. So he was he was basically scoring more and more, but burning himself out more and more as well. It was a candle burning at both ends at an increasing rate, basically. And uh, I think his Neumann saw the possibilities and the ability, but I don't think he saw that the end result had to be total burnout, which is what happened to him. He was killed in an accident, but he was totally exhausted. He was going to die anyway one way or the other.
Well, what surprised me is how many times he was actually shot down and, and you know came out and got back in again and off he went. Yeah, he had no obviously no fear, but the psychologist said of him that he was not a schizophrenic personality, but he had two personas. When he got into his aeroplane and took off, he would change into the other persona, which was totally and completely focused on flying and fighting to the exclusion of everything else, uh, that he would almost enter a state of psychological ecstasy when he went into combat. With that, he had no fear at all, and being in a, in a almost psychotic state in his own little world, he could fly and fight irrespective of the dangers without seeing anything except what he was focused on. And no one could follow him, no one could copy his methods, no one could fly wing on him too, because he did things with an airplane that no one else could do. Uh, so he was a total loner, and that's that's how he was successful, not as part of a team. So his big plus also was his commanding officer saw the potential, allowed him to develop, and allowed him to fight the way he was most effective. Many other commanders would have not done that, and he wouldn't have been anywhere near as successful. Interesting character. So, uh, all we, we we've touched upon um, uh, Malta, the you know the the, the, the large unsinkable British battleship in the Med, <laughs> the Isle, Isle de Malta. Um, I think, I'm correct to say it's the most bombed place on earth during the war. Why why was it such a struggle to knock it out? Because I hadn't quite realised how on a thread it was the RAF there at some times in Malta. It's unbelievable. Well, the entire island was on a thread. Half the time, they were almost starving to death, everyone. The, the civilians far worse than the, than the garrison. who got a slightly better ration. But the Maltese islands are, are made of limestone rock. They're rocky islands. There's not much soil or anything else, so it's fairly bomb-proof as an island, as it were. There obviously is a lot of limestone shrapnel flying around above ground, but... Uh, Nobody was really above ground when the bombing went on. Malta's probably ten times worse than the Battle of Britain because the odds were longer against the RAF. Being outnumbered was worse. They were bombed on the ground far more than anyone was in the Battle of Britain daily. They lived underground almost exclusively. The me one and nine would come over from Sicily, which is about 100 kilometers away. So they'd climb up to high altitude over Sicily get into formation, put up speed, and slowly descend as they came into Malta. And it was very difficult for the RAF to get their people up in time high enough to have any chance of really taking these guys on. And that only improved when Keith Park took over as the air officer commanding Malta in the last blitz, the one on October 1942. And then he, then he had used his the experience he had from the Battle of Britain using radar and, and tactics and so on, and then things changed for the RAF. But before that, it was survival of the fittest by the grace of God. And uh, you're right, they hung by a thread almost all the way through. They, they only got Spitfires in March 1942 after they'd been fighting for uh, what's it, 21 months already. Before that, it was hurricanes. And, and they did their best, and they did enough damage to the Italian and German bombers especially and to the 109s and they survived. What amazed me was it, it didn't, it struck me as it wouldn't have necessarily been that much of a bigger push by the Luftwaffe to, or you know, maybe not oh, starve them out of everything rather than necessarily put boots in the ground for an invasion. It really was that close, but there was seemingly not quite that enough effort push supplies of the, the Luftwaffe had to, to quite push it that far? The Luftwaffe had no spare capacity to attack Malta except by taking it from somewhere else. So every time they put in enough aircraft and assets to attack Malta, they were coming from the Russian front primarily and secondary from North Africa, from the support of Rommel. So in, in Russia, the war sort of calms down during winter so they could pull Air Force assets out from, say, uh, November, December through to about March, April maybe. Then they had to go back to the Russian front after the, after the you know, the spring thaw and the, and the mud and so on. And uh, in North Africa, well, they had, they had to make a choice. Do they take the aircraft from North Africa and, and bomb Malta into almost submission, thereby improving the supplies going to North Africa, and then they rush the aircraft back to Rommel again, and within weeks the British start operating out of Malta against the supply line. So it was it was not enough forces for too many jobs. And there was no never ever a solution to that. If they'd ever really gone into Hammer Malta then significant 
numbers of aircraft would have been missing on the Russian front. It's like the boy with the finger in the dike in Holland, you know, or with many fingers and many holes in the dike. It's, it was a no-win situation. You can't fight three or four fronts with the assets for two. It really is relentless for these uh, for these pilots. You know, if you're in the Russian front and, and the wind comes, you thought you might be able to put your feet up and uh, can't fly, but no, we'll, we'll send you to some hot weather. We'll send you to the yes. bed. <laughs> I'm a member of a veterans group here, the Moth, a member of the Orders of the Tin Hat, which is like the British Legion. One of our senior chaps there, his father was a Malta fighter pilot, and uh, he has his logbook, and I've studied this logbook just to see what life was like for a Spitfire pilot in, in, in the worst part of the Brits. He was there from uh, February to May 1942, right when the worst split was on. It's just amazing to look at these, a document like that and to imagine what sort of life this person must have led. Uh, after what was it, four months, he was put on a, on a transport plane and shipped out of there because he was finished. Physically, mentally, he was just totally finished. And that was the story of all those multi guys. No one lasted more than a few months. So they either died, got wounded, or they got sent home. Have you read Jeffrey Wellham's book, First Light? It's when he's after, he's sent to Malta and he starts to get, say, sight goes, isn't it, through stress? And any book you read about anyone at Malta, even Bierling, the famous Canadian, in the third blitz, the top scorer, he also, no one was immune from it. Uh, and, and Malta was a place for characters that Mossar would have fitted in beautifully in Malta. You know, the characters, the, the non-conformers, the loners, those sort of people thrived in Malta. Because if you wanted to fight, it was a paradise for that, that you got. But uh, the food was dreadful. They had Malta dog, which was dysentery all the time. You know, they got no sleep because they got bombed 24 hours a day, basically. But if you if you enjoy the adrenaline rush and getting into trouble and fighting, you got that. What What's the big game changer in the Med? Is it the arrival of the Spitfire or the arrival of the Americans? Or? The arrival of the Spitfire in, in Malta was critical, I think. There were just enough of them and, and brought in a tremendous sacrifice. I mean, the Royal Navy lost a lot of capital ships bringing aircraft in into Malta, the Ark Royal, Eagle, uh, the Barham, the battleship, and many cruisers and, and, and destroyers and so on. So they were getting just enough uh, aircraft into Malta to keep it going. It's almost like Stalingrad where the Russians fed in just enough troops to hold the Germans. It's almost the same kind of thing. Because they realize the longer they can hold Malta, the more of a stranglehold they will be in North Africa. The two are totally independent, interdependent. And I don't think the Germans ever really understood that well enough. You know, you, you can't split forces all the time. You have to pick a focus point and say, right, we're going to go in here and make come to, you know, bring things to a decision there. I never did it. It's again the German weakness is almost always strategic it, it's a strategic short sightedness, maybe. Well how uh, you know, how much did they learn fighting in the Med, because it, it, it struck me that perhaps it, when we get to the Allied invasion of Sicily, the Germans still perhaps still haven't learned lessons from the desert, uh, which the Allies have developed, you know, against them. They, they're not really fighting the same game as the Allies. Would that be fair? Yeah, that is fair. I, I would say that, just to go back first to your earlier question, the turning point, look, whether you like it or not, a turning point in North Africa was certainly Montgomery. And Montgomery's, you know, a difficult customer, abrasive, uh, arrogant, whatever. None of that mattered because he won. And he kept on. That, that, that war, that's what counts. Man's personality is really irrelevant almost. Uh, that was certainly one fact. He didn't attack until he knew he could win, that he would win, and he got that message and that belief through to the troops. That's two very, very important things. And his troops, his own troops loved him. Everyone outside the 8th Army probably hated him. And then, of course, Conningham with the uh, Desert Air Force also is a critical factor. By that stage, you know, the Air Force had a long history of supporting the 8th Army as they went backwards and forwards along the coast of North Africa. And eventually they got good at what they were doing, which was supporting the Army. Especially the light bombers, you know, the, the, the twin-engine bombers were really quite critical for the 8th Army. When Rommel did his final advance uh, with the Gazala Gallop and, and then back to uh, First Battle of Alamein, Alam Halfa, it's especially the RAF medium bombers that played a critical role in stopping the, the German hooks around the south. They send the tanks in around the side of the front lines in the south. 
they were stopped partly by British armor and Montgomery's sighting of dug-in tanks and guns, but they were also stopped by the medium bombers bombing the supply lines of the tanks, all the trucks bringing in ammunition and fuel, that's what the bombers were bombing, not the tanks, because you're not going to destroy too many tanks bombing there, you've got to destroy the soft-skinned vehicles that are keeping them there. I think the Desert Air Force by then had learned a lesson. Look, Montgomery, if he did nothing else, he put an end to the so-called jock columns in North Africa. He put an end to the frigging around, splitting your forces, etc., and concentrating, fighting a division as a division. He did, he, he did the right thing. By the time you get into Tunisia, you know, once, once Montgomery had won Alamein, there was nothing the Germans could do. They had nothing left. The Italians had been dropped and left behind. They had no armor left. They had hardly any air force left. And they were running so fast. And by the time they got to Gila at the other end where they turned around twice before, the Allies were invading into Tunisia. So the back door had been shut. By that stage, Malta was active again and they had aircraft flying from North Africa. The supply train into Tripoli to supply the Africa Corps was cut. So there was no turnaround for Rommel the third time and they just carried on chasing him all the way back into Tunisia. Now that's Montgomery has been criticized for being slow chasing Rommel. Well he chased him and he never once did he turn around and have to go back himself. You know forget the personality and look at the results. But I think a, a critical thing in the Mediterranean was American bombers in Tunisia had started already and, and the RAF bombers but the Americans strategically, the 400 bombers and the twin engine bombers in Tunisia bombed continuously all the Luftwaffe airfields in Tunisia. And they took the losses, etc., but it doesn't take too much of that to become cumulative and have an effect. They literally bombed them right out of North Africa, and then they did exactly the same thing in Sicily and exactly the same thing in southern Italy. And each time it worked. It doesn't matter how good your fighter pilots are, how many victories they got, how many aces you got, if they bombed on the ground, it's all meaningless. Could the Germans have done anything to counter that? Well, the fighters couldn't. The fighters were fighting as hard as they could to stop that and protect their own bases. It's just a lack of numbers. It's a lack of numbers. And, uh, well, the Germans were never prepared for a long war anyway. They were prepared for short blitzkrieg, and they didn't, right from the beginning, they, they didn't have a, a war-fitting economy and production, etc., etc. And that didn't really change that much during the war. And uh, the Americans... Uh, once they have once they have an idea and, and an aim, they go for it and they keep going for it. The bombing in 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 Tunisia and Sicily and Italy was really critical. You know that the German fighters had to leave Sicily four days after the invasion because they could no longer exist on their own airfields. They were just getting bombed right out of there. Not just the aircraft, all the other equipment, the fuel, the you know all the ground facilities. So it's Montgomery is a critical factor. Desert Air Force experience is a critical factor. And American bombing is a critical factor. Presumably, pilots are also with being withdrawn for home defence because, you know, from the west you've got huge the huge bombing campaign over Germany. So again, presumably, pilots being withdrawn for that. Yes, withdrawn from all fronts. I mean, the, the Italians here had no fighters left at all by September '44. They'd all been pulled back into Germany. In, in Russia, they pulled back two thirds of the fighters. They had no choice. They had to either defend Germany or or somewhere else, but they, there's no ways they could defend multiple multiple areas. They just didn't have the they didn't have the numbers ever. And and, and the other thing affecting numbers is the the German stubbornness to change their training. Their training is extremely thorough, average of two years to produce a, a qualified fighter pilot, and even then, he's very vulnerable the first few months until he gets some hands-on experience. So. Whereas the RAF from the time of the Battle of Britain, they were producing pilots six to eight months. Okay, many of them got killed, but many of them survived and were effective enough. You know, cannon fodder is cannon fodder. Someone's got to die in war. It's, you know, it's, just, it's an un uncomfortable reality. And uh, the Germans always try and be perfect, you know, perfectionism. And, and in war, quality is not necessarily that good a thing. I mean, Russian, Russian armament production way not produce the Germans, and they didn't worry about the finer points. You know, if you've got 10 tanks opening fire, who cares if it's, you know, well welded or rounded off or whatever it might be. It's there, it's shooting, it's, it's an asset, even if it lasts 10 days. For 10 days, it's doing, it's doing damage. Did, did they ever manage to uh, develop any new tactics to offset this sort of overwhelming allied air superiority? 
I mean, I guess, I guess especially when you've got a thousand bomber raids, that's a lot of targets to try and take out. I suppose the most effective tactic was the storm grouping, you know, the the the, the storm troops. Uh, they were very effective when they worked, and that was was the problem. You know, by that by that stage in the war, and that's what about July 1944, just after the invasion. Yeah, you know, the Germans were always sort of somewhat baffled and incapable of handling the American four-engine bomber formations. I mean, you're looking at in the beginning, they were going maybe 100 at a time. By 1944, late 44, they'd come in at 2,000 at a time. You know, 1,000 escorting fighters, the sheer numbers. The American bombers were very well armed. They were armed with, with 0.5 inch machine guns with an effective range of about 1,000 yards. You know, Lancaster's got an effective range of about 250, 300 yards with a you know, three inch gun uh, in their turrets. So the American bombers were dangerous. They flew good formations. There were a lot of them, and uh, as soon as they had the Mustang fighter for long-range protection, they were almost invincible. You would have needed, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 good German fighter pilots to take something like that on. And then how do you break up the bomber formations? That is the critical question. Uh, and the only method that ever really worked was the head-on attack. And, and even for an American bombardment group, it's about 30, 35 four-engine bombers, and they're flying at different LTs, they're staggered, very good formation, but it's quite compact, so you can't attack them with a group of 30 or 36 German fighters. The most you can attack them with is a startle, about eight. You can only have eight fighters flying next to each other coming in head-on at one of these bombardment groups, else they'd overlap. You now are taking 30 aircraft, which are doing their best to shoot you down with eight fighters flying next to each other, and you can bet your bottom dollar they are really scared. They're approaching each other at six, seven hundred miles an hour. You've got less than 10 seconds firing time once effective range is reached to hit anything. And the, and the only thing you want to hit is the cabin because anything else is almost a waste of time. So the head-on attack is, is effective, but it's very difficult. And you need, you need experienced pilots to do it and pilots that believe in what they're doing and in the efficiency of their own method. And there weren't too many of those left anymore by then. No, that that's almost seems like a suicide mission. <laughs> well, a head-on attack's not a suicide mission if you know what you're doing. You know, the big question is, do you go over the bombers when you get too close or under them? Both are sort of, you know, losing tactics to adopt. You're going you're gonna to get shot at either way. But by that stage, the new pilots coming in with fewer training hours because of the fuel shortage, uh, very limited gunnery skills, no experience, limited tactical skills, that's why the storm grouper was brought in, because the storm grouper was a method by which inexperienced pilots who couldn't hardly shoot straight at all could be effective. Uh, and they, they'd come in in a V-shape, and they're flying Parker Wolf 190s covered in armor with uh, normally two heavy machine guns, two 20-millimeter cannons, and two 30-millimeter cannons in the wings. Uh, there's extra armored glass. The fuel tanks are armored and they'd be coming in exactly behind the bomber, so there was no deflection whatsoever. Just opening fire and, and, and shooting forwards, they would hit something once they got close enough, and that was the idea. If you could get the American escort fighters out of the road, which is a big if, then the storm group was very effective. They, they could, in seconds, go right through from the back of bombardment group and shoot down 20 out of 30 in a few seconds. But the problem was the American escort fighters, while you're coming in, it takes time. You're fairly slow because of all the armor and the ammunition and the heavy guns you're carrying. And the escort fighters will make mincemeat out of you long before you get near the bombers if, if they're not hindered by someone else. And that gets back to fighter versus fighter combat. And the didn't, Germans didn't have enough fighters or enough experienced good fighter pilots anymore. Presumably they just, at some point in 1945, they just, the Luftwaffe effectively ceased to exist. It presumably just ran out of... Everything. Well, by 1945, they'd basically withdrawn from, from trying to defend Germany, except with jet fighters and flak, and all the other aircraft were put desperately onto the Eastern Front to try and stop the Russians. So uh, they just given up over Germany, and rightly so. There were there was no point. So uh, at the end of the war, what happens to the Luftwaffe pilots? Are they treated any different from Wehrmacht prisoners of war, or are they singled out? Or well, the pilots weren't treated any better or worse than anyone else. With the exception of the ME-262 jet pilots, the jet pilots that got into Western hands were whisked off to the UK, America, ready to pass on what they knew about jet aircraft and flying and fighting them. 
So they got some special treatment and often an early release. The big thing at the end of the war, the, the, even the Western powers were not prepared for the numbers of prisoners they got. They weren't prepared to suddenly house and feed millions of prisoners, and that's what they got. There were a lot of deaths in the other prisoner war camps in Germany because they were just confining people in the fields. They had enough to eat, barely, but they had enough to eat, but they didn't have shelter. You know, in the European climate, the wet and the cold and so on, uh, and these are people that have been through six or seven years of war. They're not in the best of condition. In the first few months, there were very bad conditions in the West in the prisoner war camps just through circumstance, not, not because they were trying to be nasty to them or anything. But uh, the prisoners in England, or in the UK and in America, often had to work one or two years, even three years after the war before they were allowed to come back to Germany. So there was a lot of delay in getting, getting the boys home, as it were. But uh, other than that, the conditions of imprisonment in the West were, were humane. Many, many prisoners were released within two, three months. As long as they could you know, prove who they were through the papers they had, and so long as they weren't major aces or commanders or anything like that, they were released quite soon. If they were Nazi party members, that would be a different story. That then goes to need denazification courts and all sorts of things like that. But uh, yeah, the West was generally humane, but uh, the French were a lot less kind than the British or Americans, both in France and in North Africa. And of course, the Russians were predictably. But one has to say the Russian treatment of prisoners was in many ways no worse than the treatment of their own troops. They, they didn't have the resources. They didn't have the physical resources to house prisoners. They didn't have the food or medical supplies. And their own troops were in the same basket, basically. Finally, I, I, I'm guessing uh, sort of it's easy to see uh, from the German point of view the Mediterranean campaign sort of being a sideshow to Russia, especially sort of from the army. But... Was it a sideshow for the Luftwaffe? I get the feeling it's not a sideshow, really. No, I, I agree with you. If if you look at, I think it's the very first figure in the book which shows the number of German fighter units on each front during the war. And you can see the top part of that graph. The Russian front is taking 50, 60% of Luftwaffe assets. But once the Mediterranean theatres open up, uh, the Russian front allocation was going down 40-30%. So even though the Mediterranean was absorbing, say, 20% or 15% of total Luftwaffe assets, the difference that made to the Russian front especially was significant. The Russian front, the Luftwaffe, was all, almost always in a fairly touch-and-go situation. They never had enough numbers for the huge space and, and the huge requirements there. And any significant withdrawal of units for another theater and that was the Mediterranean theater for the first, you know, till 1943, was very significant. So, the, yeah, you're right. The Mediterranean theater uh, punched above their weight, basically, in terms of throwing off Luftwaffe assets, yes. It just, yeah, as you said, drained them off sort of quietly in, in a sort of piecemeal manner, and before, before they knew they'd lost a lot more than they really expected uh, to. I mean, the Luftwaffe in, in the first Russian went the end of 1941, and going into 42. For five months, most uh, about a third or forty percent even of of Luftwaffe assets on the Russian front were taken and put into the attack on Malta. Then they go back again in about May for the spring offensive or whatever they're going to do in the Eastern Front. But what's going back? The people are tired. They're short of aircraft. They're short of everything. Was they've taken losses constantly. They haven't been on rescue for five months. They've been fighting their hearts out in a different theatre. They just they just keep on degrading themselves because they're getting exhausted materially, physically and mentally. It's, it's a no-win situation. Yeah, yeah. by that point it certainly was. Patrick, thank you for joining me. If anyone would like to pick up a copy of Patrick's book, it is Alarm Start South and The Final Defeat. I will put a link on the website. Don't forget, if you want to hear Patrick chatting about the Battle of Britain, head over to patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Well, that's all from me for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.